Hi, I'm Richard Karras, General Manager here at NVIDIA for the Omniverse platform. And today, I'm here to tell you about the Metaverse. 3D workflows have become essential across all sorts of industries. Industries like architectural and design, visual effects and game developers, product developers who are designing products that they want to visualize before they commit to them in the physical world. Even scientists and healthcare professionals are using 3D to visualize their data. And of course, robotics and autonomous driving have essential needs for 3Ds. And with these 3D workflows, there's a number of challenges. Challenges between the artists who are using the different tools and those very tools which do not talk well with one another, forcing you to export and import across applications and with projects are getting bigger all the time. Add to that the challenges of remote locations. Artists that are working across a building or across the globe have challenges because of how they're working, the size of the data that they're working with, and how they maintain the integrity of that data. What is the single source of truth when you're working across 100 people across the globe? These are real world challenges that 3D artists face every day. We face them too here at NVIDIA. We have the challenges of remote teams around the world. We visualize everything we build and we're building huge virtual worlds, all of which use different tools, some that we create, some that our developers create, and they present challenges to us. And that's what Omniverse is all about, solving some of these challenges. Omniverse has been in development for a long time, and it's been an evolutionary process. You know, we had projects like Holodeck, which allowed artists to work together in a VR environment on a project. Then, with the advent of RTX, real-time ray tracing and photorealistic rendering, we had a breakthrough for having these kind of environments be true to reality. Now we combined those things together and we learned about what are the challenges that we would need to accomplish with Omniverse. And Omniverse set out to unify those 3D worlds with a common way for all different types of applications to work together and a common way for people to collaborate, whether they're across the room or across the globe. And the realization of this dream came true in December of 2020 when we released the open beta of Omniverse. And now with over 30,000 people using it, we're really onto something special. Now, what makes Omniverse so amazing is we based it on USD. USD, or Universal Scene Description, was first developed by Pixar. And it was developed to find a way to communicate all the different types of things that are going on in the 3D world across the different use cases. Now, it's been adopted by many verticals across, from architect software to product design software. And, and we put the basis of Omniverse on USD. By doing so, it allowed us to have a common format. Whether we're talking with architects, our game developers, or visual effects artists, we now have a common way to communicate all of the things that we're doing on that platform. And once we had that common way, we can now bring those tools that they're using into that environment, and they'll all be consistent. So you can be using Unreal Engine, or Maya, or 3ds Max, and connect it to Omniverse, and have a real dynamic connection. And by that, I mean you can be doing something in Omniverse, and it'll update in real time on your software, or vice versa. And this dynamic connection gives us the sum is greater than its parts with what we're doing in this space. Now, I want to show you an example here of three different applications working together on the Omniverse platform. And we sped it up a little bit for the sake of the presentation, but what's really amazing to watch here is the changes that are taking place in one application are updating in all of the applications at the same time. So whether they're changing the landscape or the sun or how things are moving around in different locations, it's all happening in a collaborative real world scenario. Now, Omniverse has five main components the first is Nucleus. Nucleus is how we manage the data between all of these applications. How we manage it, whether it's across the room and across the globe, you have this as a traffic cop, if you will, for your data. It manages the delta of change between the different users. Connect is how we connect to the third-party products. So as we build more and more connectors, more and more third-party tools become live on the Omniverse platform. Kit is a toolkit that's on the platform that allows developers to build their own custom applications or for advanced users to enhance the platform and customize it for their own workflows. And of course, the simulation tools that we're so famous for, simulating fire, water, smoke, all those things in real time are on the platform. And then we have the world's most advanced renderer called RTX Renderer. What makes this so advanced is that it applies multi-GPU technology using RTX for real-time photorealistic rendering. 
And this is a platform that's been built for many years across the technologies that NVIDIA is so famous for, starting with CUDA and our RTX cores, all the way up through the different AI libraries, leading to those five core modules that I was just telling you about. And then on top of that, you can extend Omniverse to make it your own, and you can build applications on top of it. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about those. Now with Omniverse, we have some core applications, create and view. Create is an application built on Kit, that toolkit I told you about in the five modules. And Create allows you to do things like create 3D objects, animate those objects, add lights and shadows and things like that. And View allows you to view that world and view it all in real time. But we have other applications that are being built on this platform as well. Things like Audio to Face, where you can drive animations just by a voice or a dialogue track. And one that we're really excited about that's just recently gone into open beta called Machinima. Machinima is a storytelling tool that allows you to take components from different games, bring them into the environment, use 3D assets, use the other technologies on Omniverse, and create stories. Let me show you an example of some stuff that's been done with Machinima. NVIDIA is not the only company building applications on the Omniverse platform. Third-party companies are now starting to build them as well. One of those companies, Bentley, is building their digital twin on the Omniverse platform. Bentley is in use by over 90% of the world's top 250 engineering firms. And together, we've been visualizing what their next generation of products are going to be like using Omniverse. Let's take a look. As I said, Omniverse is a platform for collaboration and simulation. Now, typically we think of collaboration across different users that are doing things, right? And we certainly do that. But you can also, as a single creator, collaborate across your applications on the system that you're using. Typically, if you were using multiple applications, you would export and import between the applications. And we know most creators do. But now with Omniverse, you can have those applications be connected to the Omniverse platform and run live. So all you have to do is go back and forth between them. So whether you're in Max, Maya, Unreal Engine, Blender, anything that you're using connected to Omniverse, you have them all live on your platform, making a very easy workflow for you to get things done faster and more efficient than ever before. But of course, it really takes off when you're collaborating across different users that are doing a project. And like I said, across the room or across the globe, you're connected live. You're visualizing everything that you do live on the Omniverse platform. We believe that anything that will be built will be visualized. Anything that moves will be autonomous. And anything that's autonomous will be simulated. So what do we mean by those? Well, rather than go to the expense of building something in the physical world, why not build it in the synthetic world? Learn what it's gonna look like. Learn how things are gonna affect it, whether you're building a building and the sun is gonna affect it, or weather, or you're building a car, or whatever it is, by visualizing it in the synthetic world first, you get to make a lot of decisions that would be very costly if you were doing it in the physical world. So that's what we mean about building and visualizing things first. Now, things that move that are autonomous. When you're bringing robots into play in factories, efficiency is incredibly important. How they know to get around, where they're moving, how, what kinds of things they carry. And so 
the more we can make that an autonomous uh, benefit, the better it's going to be for efficiency in that factory. But what comes with that is the need to train these robots. And so that's where the simulation part comes in. It used to be if you were going to train a robot, you would plug your computer into that robot and you would just program it and train it to do things. But why not build a hundred or a thousand robots in the synthetic world and use AI to train them all at once? So that when you download that information to the actual physical robot, it's many thousands of times smarter. And that's going to add for even more efficiency when you're talking about robots in factories or autonomous vehicles, things like that. And so that's what we mean by visualization, autonomous, and simulation all taking place on this Omniverse platform. We have an Omniverse for everyone. Whether you're an individual that's downloaded the Omniverse open beta and doing things with it in your creative workflows today, or the recently announced Omniverse Enterprise, which is a true enterprise-level platform for use across multiple different industries. Omniverse Enterprise comes with enterprise support, installation, and support for our certified EGX systems. So major companies now have been evaluating this platform for use to revolutionize how they're creating things, whether it's in factories and design and architectural firms, movies and game developers. Omniverse Enterprise is a true enterprise-level platform. And when I talk about the different variations of Omniverse, let me just kind of go through the, the different use cases. You can be on any RTX system today and run Omniverse. So whether you're an artist working across multiple applications and doing things, Omniverse has some benefits for you right away. Or you can be a small work group and run Omniverse across that work group, having Nucleus be one of the traffic cops on those systems and collaborate together as a small team doing great things. But we also now, with Omniverse Enterprise, can get into the bigger systems. So whether it's across an entire infrastructure that's running it, or you can even virtualize it across our vGPU systems. And we're partnering with the top industry software developers to ensure that their leading products are connected to the Omniverse platform. Companies like Autodesk and Adobe, Bentley, Blender, and many more are creating connectors to connect their products to the Omniverse platform. Omniverse is an active evaluation across over 400 companies, across multiple verticals, doing all sorts of incredible things to help revolutionize their workflows. We're seeing things like Ericsson, who's using Omniverse to figure out where to put antennas for 5G throughout different cities. Companies like KPF, who are visualizing how weather and sun will affect the buildings that they're building. One of the companies we're working with, BMW, we've worked very closely with to visualize what the factory of the future is going to be like. You know, in the future, we're going to see more and more robots being used and more and more of the factory that's going to have a lot of things that are alive, from the computers to the, how the people are moving throughout the factory, things like that. And decisions that have to be made can be much more efficient and effective to be made synthetically before committed to the physical world. So what do we mean by that? Well, you can imagine if they're going to be changing a car on the assembly line, there's a whole lot of decisions that have to be made in that factory, where the machines go, where the parts come in. How are the people going to move those parts? What are the robots going to do to help move the heavy stuff around? And if you make those decisions in the physical world and you get it wrong, you have to change it. Now, when you're producing over 2 million cars a year, those kind of changes can be very costly. So if you make those changes in the synthetic world using something like Omniverse, you can save incredible amounts of money before you've committed to the physical world. So I'd like to show you a video that kind of goes into detail about what this vision of the factory of the future is really going to be. We are inside the digital twin of BMW's assembly system, powered by Omniverse. For the first time, we are able to have our entire factory in simulation. Global teams can collaborate using different software packages like Revit, CATIA or Point Clouds to design and plan the factory in real time 3D. The capability to operate in a perfect simulation revolutionizes BMW's planning processes. BMW regularly reconfigures its factories to accommodate new vehicle launches. Here we see two planning experts located in different parts of the world, testing a new line design in Omniverse. We would like to be able to do this at scale in simulation. That's exactly why NVIDIA has Digital Human for simulation. Digital humans are trained with data from real associates. You could then use Digital Humans in simulation to test new workflows for worker ergonomics and efficiency. Robots are crucial for a modern production system. With NVIDIA ISAC Robotics Platform, BMW is deploying a fleet of intelligent robots 
for logistics to improve the material flow in our production. This agility is necessary since we produce 2.5 million vehicles per year. IsaacSim generates millions of synthetic images and vary the environment to teach the robots. Domain randomization can generate an infinite permutation of photorealistic objects, textures, orientations, and lighting conditions. It is ideal for generating ground truth, whether for detection, segmentation, or depth perception. With NVIDIA's Fleet Command, your associates can securely orchestrate robots and other devices in the factory for mission control. They can monitor in real time complex manufacturing cells, update software over the air, launch robot missions, and teleoperate. We're in the digital twin of one of your factories, but you have 30 others spread across 15 countries. The scale of BMW production is impressive, Milan. Indeed, Jensen. The scale and complexity of our production network requires BMW to constantly innovate. I am happy about the tight collaboration between our two companies. NVIDIA Omniverse and NVIDIA AI give us the chance to simulate all 31 factories in our production network. These new innovations will reduce the planning times, improve flexibility and precision, and at the end, produce 30% more efficient planning processes. So one of the other companies I mentioned, KPF, are paving the way for next generation design for architecture. We're seeing more and more buildings these days that are built with mirrored facades and all sorts of incredible technology. But a lot of times, if they're not simulated before they're built, real world situations can happen, like the reflection of the sun can be causing havoc across the city if they didn't fully understand what that was gonna be like. Using Omniverse, we have true to reality simulation. No more baking things and trying to guess what it might be. By using a real world simulation, they can put all the kinds of testings and scenarios onto that building before they've committed to physically build it. One of the other companies doing some amazing work with Omniverse is Woods Bagot, an architectural firm that's using Omniverse to not only visualize how they're building their work, but also of how that building is gonna affect the landscape and the scenario where it's going to be. That's a very important element for when you're designing something that might be in the middle of a city, for example. Industrial Light and Magic is one of the world's leading visual effects houses. And we've had a relationship with them that spans over 20 years. They've been helping us to evaluate Omniverse in their workflows across all of their different studios across the globe and the different partners that they work with. Another partner we're working with is WPP. They're the world's largest advertising firm and they do over 1,500 productions a year. Each of those productions have challenges of the remote locations, but they also are considerate to the carbon emissions that each of those productions take. So they've been working with us to figure out how they can better optimize their workflow, better use synthetic environments rather than always going out on location, and producing things that are gonna be more efficient and give them more creative options. And together, we've been working with them to really help change that landscape. And they put together a great video for us, which I'd like to show you now. WPP is the largest marketing services organization on the planet. And because of that, we're also one of the largest production companies in the world. That is a major carbon hotspot for us. We've partnered with NVIDIA to capture locations virtually and bring them to life in studios with Omniverse. Over 10 billion points are turned into a giant mesh in Omniverse. For the first time, we can shoot locations virtually that are as real as the actual places themselves. Omniverse also changes the way we make work. A collaborative platform that means multiple artists at multiple points in the pipeline in multiple parts of the world can collaborate on a single scene. Real-time CGI and sustainable studios, collaboration with Omniverse, is the future of film at WPP. In the future, more content and more experiences will be done in the virtual world than in the physical world. More markets and economics will take place in those virtual worlds than in the physical world. Omniverse is an exchange of virtual worlds connecting everything and everyone. It is the connector of the physical and virtual worlds. Whether you're an individual creator or a member of a team in a large enterprise, we have an Omniverse for you. So I invite you today, using an RTX-based NVIDIA system, to download Omniverse Beta and experience it for yourself. We'll see you in the Omniverse.
Hello, everyone. My name is Noli Morimoto, Vice President and Chief Technology Officer of IBM Japan. Today, I'm very honored and pleased to be able to share with you the IBM recent development and progress of IBM Quantum programs. Before I begin, uh, let me explain a little bit about the background of why we're doing this. As we all facing, the world is facing a, a lot of the critical issues for human being. Not to mention about the food, energy, transportations, and mobility. We're all facing into the serious pandemic issues as well, and that threaten the human's health. That's been said, we are all been facing to the situation that the science has never been stronger and demanded than ever in the world. And in order to advance the science, the discover of a new technology, new materials are very, very critical. So we have been focusing into several key technologies to drive that. One is AI, the artificial intelligence. The second is computing, in general, including the classical and future computing. Third is importance of data, not just the amount or mass of the data, but the quality of the data. And number four is the infrastructure. More specifically, the computing infrastructure including the hybrid cloud and the data connections, IoT sensor networks. Now let's focus on computing. IBM is viewing the computing as these categories. The first bits, second is neuron, and third is qubit. In the bits, it represents the classical computer advancement, mainly driven by the semiconductor transistor shrinkage. IBM has been doing this area of research since the beginning of the computing era, almost five, half century ago. And we start with the micrometers scales of a semiconductor transistor shrinkage down to now into the nanometer scale of shrinkage. IBM has just announced the state-of-the-art most advanced semiconductor chip in two nanometer node. With this later technology called GAA nanosheet, we will be able to fabricate transistors as small as less than 50 nanometers. That is about the half of the diameters of the coronavirus. And we believe that this technology will take us even further to the single nanometers or even smaller scale and higher performance, lower energy of the chips. However, that alone is not enough. On the other side, we're also advancing the AI technology that associate with the neuron. One area is the software and algorithm side. We developed AI called Watson, and it shows the world that what AI and computer artificial intelligence could do in the Jeopardy quiz show in 2011. And later, you've seen the advancement of artificial intelligence in many areas, including the machine translation, visual recognitions, and more. But all of that actually still focusing to so-called narrow AI, which is the single domain, single task. Complete and accurate data set is required for the heavy training and problems that we can address is that is the only problem that has a single and accurate correct answers. Instead, we need to focus in on much broader capability of AI, which is the broad AI, multi-domain, multitask. 
machine can train and be learning even with the incomplete and insufficient set of data. And we need to focus on the problems that not necessarily has a one single accurate answers. So those technology advancement all is going to drive the machine computation power necessity. Even today, with the growing number of data, the computational requirement in the world has been driving increasing 2x every year. That is very, very significant amount of computing power that we need. So we need the advancing the new way of computing, new technology, new chips, and for particularly for the AI workload. So that's the second group of technology that we're focusing on in neuro. Even that is very clear that IBM and human being is going to run out the computation power really, really soon. So we need to come up with third element of future of computing, that is quantum. Now let's talk about quantum. Quantum computing is based on very unique capability called quantum mechanics. More specifically, two very unique aspects. One is called superpositions. The other is called entanglement. Superposition will allow us to build the quantum bit, qubit, that has the capability to be able to represent more than two states at the same time. It's different from the current bits, which can only represent one or zero single state at the time. Instead, quantum bit or qubits can represent more than one states in the probabilistic states. That is superposition. An entanglement will allow the multiple qubits to entangle and influence to each other, either straight, same bit flip, or the negative bit flip. No matter how far those two qubits are, once they've been entangled, they'll be associated together and reflect each other's movement. And this is called entanglement. With the combination of these two unique quantum mechanics characteristics, we'll be able to build the quantum bits, quantum circuits. And those circuits will have much more diverse, diversified and unique capability to represent the mathematical representations on computer that has never been possible before with classical computers. By combining those qubits, we'll be able to create the quantum circuits called quantum gates. In classical computer, we have a gates called AND gates, NOR gates, NOT gates, and those gates, we have a about seven fundamental gates. Instead, in quantum gates, we already have more than 20 different quantum gates we can combine to build the circuits. And that will become much more rich representations on quantum circuits. In the classical circuits, you can only represent one state at the time. Instead, in the quantum gates circuits, you'll be able to represent much more diversified and rich mathematical representation with a smaller size of bits. And by combining those quantum gates, you'll be able to build the more complex quantum circuits called quantum algorithms. And that will be the constructing building block for more complex quantum problems, such as simulating quantum systems for physics, chemistry, material sciences, or algebraic problems such as machine learning, differential equations solving, and factorizations. Another area is called quantum search, that including the quantum Monte Carlo simulations 
optimizations and graphs. All this, it may look or sounds like very complicated, but from the user point of view, it's just as simple as running on the piece of software on computers. You can still use your own computers connected to the networks by just running your own QuizKit algorithms on Python or any other languages you like, and use that to call the quantum algorithm into your circuits or programs to run it. And once it's connected to the quantum computers, your programs will be compiled into the signals that have been sent to quantum computer, and quantum computers will translate that into microwaves signals that is going to send directly into the quantum bit to run the quantum sub circuits on the computers. And the result will be measured coming back and all the way back to your computers as the answers. That's so simple. You don't have to even worry about what is running behind these machines. Now, in order to advance this whole research areas, of course, we need a lot of work to do. One area is scaling the hardware. The other is building the quantum cloud platforms that allows people to access to the quantum machine much easier. The other way is build the application tools for quantum developments. So first, in the hardware side, Let's take a look at the uh, inside of the quantum computers. In IBM, we use the superconductive quantum bits that has the chip been built inside the refrigerators called delusion refrigerators. And all the way chip is installed at the bottom of the refrigerators, which has been cooling down to the 15 milli kelvins. That is almost minus 273 degrees, absolute zero degrees. It's the coolest place in the universe ever. In order to drive the computation on these qubits, we need to use a microwave. Therefore, in the other side, you see the microwave generators and microwave controllers. And then your computer program will be running on the cloud and then taking into this microwave controllers to convert that into the microwave to be sent into the qubit underneath the, this delusion refrigerators. The key components are the chip itself, and that is very obvious. So IBM is building this quantum chip, uh, you know, based on many, many of our accumulated semiconductor packaging technologies that we have been doing for a long, long time. In 2019, we released a 27 qubit chip called Falcon. It with the very optimized lattice structures. Last year, we announced a 65 qubits chip called Hummingbird. It will have a scalable readout capabilities to improve the readout values and stabilities. This year, we announced 127 qubit chip called Eagle with the noble packaging and control improvement of electronics around this. With the more advanced semiconductor-based technology to miniaturize the components and packaging and integrate all the circuits, we're aiming to announce the 1,000 qubits chips called Condor by 2023. And this chip, now then we can stack this 1,000 qubit chips in to get the multiple 1,000 chips in eventually get to much, much larger size of quantum bits. The quantum machine's capability is not solely represented by the quantum bits, it including the noise levels and also the capability to be able to compute longer circuits. 
And with all the capabilities and quality, we measure this as encoded the quantum volumes. In 2019, IBM announced the roadmap of quantum volumes that we committed to improve the quantum volume by 2x every year. So we wrote the roadmap and announced it. And before two years, we are already advancing this roadmap by announced much more higher quantum volumes machines or chips earlier than scheduled. So we'll continue doing this progress and we're very confident that we'll be able to achieve or overachieve this roadmap we laid out in 2019. Which means that everybody using today's quantum computers can actually start to imagine if you can do this with today's quantum computers, what will be possible two years later, three years later, or five years later? And you can confidently uh, think of that you will be able to get that level of hardware performance up within a certain period of time. Therefore, you can imagine or start to assess what will be possible in what years in your area of applications. Now, in order to advance this, it's not only the qubits and chips. We need to also uh, advance a lot of the surrounding electronics, including the cables, microwave attenuators, amplifiers, materials, and packagings. And ultimately, the, we need to build the much bigger delusion refrigerators that can even have a human inside. It is called super fridge in IBM. And we're building our, the very unique, very large uh, delusion refrigerators as well. Now, in order to advance the quantum computers, it's not only the hardware or chip or system side, right? We also need to build the computational platforms, software uh, platform to support the developers or researchers to use the quantum computer without knowing or learning too much about the complexity of quantum's algorithm itself. So the compiler layer, runtime layers, and those are cloud accessible uh, algorithms and open source softwares are very, very important. But we have been piggybacking on this advancement that we have been doing in the last half centuries or so. And we don't need to wait that long to have this on quantum scale. We can just tap into those most advanced cloud systems, open source system, algorithm sharing, and software sharing platform right now. So with this, uh, we'll be able to build quickly about those uh, shared platform for the developers in order to advance our research communities and research activities worldwide. One of the first industry academia collaboration has started in Japan with Keio University. At the time, the Dean of the School of Engineering, Professor Ito, has teamed up with IBM to start the IBM Quantum Hub at Keio University with four private companies and about half a dozen of researchers there. While well, he's a true visionary, so two associate professors at the time was promoted to full professor after the success of the launch of this uh, quantum research center at Keio. And Professor Ito himself was actually been named as a president of Keio uh, just this month. And that research center is now grew into the very large size of quantum research activity center, including more than 30 scientists and seven private companies to join. They're mainly working on those three areas. One is quantum chemistry and material sciences area. The other is from financial risk assessment and risk management area. 
and the other, one of the most pervasive and popular areas, including the artificial intelligence and quantum machine learnings. And later, in Taiwan, we also have the NTU join IBM to open the Q quantum hub in Taiwan, NTU. And that has also been grew very rapidly with a lot of active research themes coming up from there. So I'm also looking for to see more progress from there as well. And now this style of a quantum hub activities in the worldwide has grew into seven or eight uh, new hubs coming up. Most of these uh, partners we call are using the most advanced IBM quantum computers throughout the networks. Just as of the March this year, overall, so we have more than 250,000 users uh, on these quantum systems and run over 500 billion quantum circuits. We have built more than 30 quantum computers and more than 20 quantum computers are hooked active online and has more than 97% utilization from overall more than 140 clients and partners accessing to these machines. IBM recently announced one of the most strategic and advanced partnership in US with Cleveland Clinics. This is to agree the 10 years long-term research partnership, including the providing the more than 1000 qubit quantum machines on site to Cleveland Clinic with all the research collaboration and activities. We believe this is going to be one of the model case to drive and accelerate the science and discovery in Japan and Germany. Last year, we announced the two major announcements of quantum computers. It is to install the first commercial-based quantum computers outside of the United States. In Germany, with the Fraunhofer, and in Japan, with the University of Tokyo. In Japan, we're going to install the two quantum systems. One is IBM Q System 1. It's the first commercial quantum machines and we're going to install in Shin Kawasaki City in Japan. It's going to be dedicated to more than a dozen of our local partners, private companies and universities for their own research activities. But the partner can only also access to more than 20 activity connected network computings in the US. The second quantum systems is going to be installed in University of Tokyo, which is for the experiment and test and study of the new materials or temperature uh, electronics and surrounding uh, components for to build the future quantum computers. Now with all those partnerships and technology advancement of quantum are very important, but there's nothing more important than building the next generation talent and people. IBM is also committed to provide the education and brought up the next generation scientists or mathematicians or computers, uh, you know, for the worldwide young age, young generation people. We have been running a lot of the quantum hackathons worldwide. And last year, of course, it was run on digital, but we run the uh, quantum hackathon challenge in, uh, last year. And with more than 3000 people participating from 85 countries, it's probably one of the largest uh, online quantum events or hackathon events uh, that we run before, but uh, very active activities. Now, now what I'm most proud of is the number one prize was won by the Japanese students from university. 
and uh, and also many uh, Asian students, kids participate on this, including those from Taiwan. So I'm very very proud of it, and I'm looking for the more active participation from the school, from the industry, to drive this very exciting technology areas that matters to all of our lives. Now last, I'd like to show you this short video to end my speech. Thank you very much, and please stay safe, stay healthy.